Morality is very complicated. There are thousands of years and millions of pages of discourse about what it means to be good versus bad. Philosophies and religions have enumerated many different ways to conceptualize this, from systems of cyclic reincarnation with the quality of life determined by past good deeds, to impassive death gods weighing hearts against feathers and devouring those weighed down by sin, to omniscient deities doling out eternal rewards and or punishments to those judged deserving, to just not being a jerk because being a jerk feels bad, to about a million others. And that doesn't even touch on the varying definitions of what good deeds and sin and deserving even mean. Loving thy neighbor might get you into one god's good graces, while slaughtering your enemies might save you a seat next to another one. All that to say, there's a lot of reasons why we might have some trouble concisely defining the pure of heart trope. Now in general, pure of heart is a concept that classifies certain characters as moral paragons with no evil in their hearts, and what the hell that means depends strongly on the author, the character, the setting, the world lore, the phase of the moon, and whether or not they had breakfast that day. Purity of heart is often more of a metaphysical assessment than a practical one. Some supernatural entity or force will determine with 100% certainty that a given character is pure of heart, and while sometimes the character will have to do something tangible to demonstrate that in a test of character, sometimes it's just the vibes they're given off. Frequently, being deemed pure of heart is a prerequisite for something, like gaining a power or access to a place or thing. In these circumstances, it's basically equated with worthiness, with the indication that most people aren't worthy and would fail in this situation, and thus the pure of heart character is shown to be rare and special due to their purity of heart. This is a classic concept with roots in fairy tales where heroes will often be rewarded solely for their intrinsic goodness. Now, there are basically three contexts that a character's purity of heart might show up in. The most blatant is the aforementioned supernatural worthiness test, where a magically judgmental being or object will assess a character's purity of heart to decide whether or not they're worthy of some magical plot thing. Not all supernatural worthiness tests focus on being pure of heart, but they are pretty heavily correlated. These tests sometimes involve a character actually doing something heroic to prove their worthiness, but as a general rule, the magically judgmental thing can just tell if the character is worthy or not by gazing into their their innermost heart, or something. Choosing magical artifacts frequently fall into this category and just won't work in the hands of anyone deemed unworthy. As a consequence, this category is probably the one that seems the most arbitrary. It might be totally unclear why one character qualifies and another one doesn't, or why a character's more dubious actions or qualities don't disqualify them from pure of heartness. But you can't exactly argue with a choosy magical artifact. Then again, this can also be a strength of the trope, because if you want a really obvious signal that a character is trustworthy, or a previously iffy character has undergone character development, you can just have the choosy magical artifact prove it by spontaneously deeming them worthy. It's essentially a shortcut to demonstrate that they're a good person now. The second, somewhat rarer context we find this trope in is in the impossibly pure trope, where a character being pure of heart is framed as an incredibly unlikely occurrence because the prevailing assumption is that everyone is a little bit evil, but the character assessed is so magically incorruptible that this just isn't true of them, which often stuns the testing entity, which simply can't believe that anyone is that genuinely good. This doesn't usually show up with choosy magical artifacts, which tend to work on the assumption that someone's gonna be worthy, but some Sometimes it shows up when a villain has some kind of corruptive ability or magical attack that manipulates the evil in someone's heart, and it just doesn't work on this character because there's nothing for it to hit. Pretty specific, but honestly really funny whenever it happens. And finally, the most mundane option, sometimes a character is practically pure. There's nothing magical about it, no supernatural judge giving them the certified good boy seal of approval. This is just a character who is completely morally incorruptible. They can't be swayed by selfish desires, they'll always do what they believe to be right no matter the personal cost, they might think about taking the selfish option but they will never actually do it. Paragons frequently overlap with this. This pure of heart character will always do the right thing even if it comes at a cost, and they often won't even indulge in angst over it, since angst would imply regrets and one never need regret doing the right thing. But that's a matter of the character's individual personality. Some of these incorruptible characters do indulge in a little angst, but they'll still hold to their principles even if they're tempted to let them slide. For this trope to apply, the character has to be seen as incorruptible in-universe, not just by the audience. Characters in this context will often be able to heroically resist things that overwhelm other, less pure of heart characters, both mundane things like bribes and threats, and more fantastical things like possession and mind control. But while these contexts illuminate some of the stories that use the pure of heart trope, we still haven't actually defined what it means for a character to be pure of heart. What character traits are these supernatural judges even looking for? Well, unsurprisingly, that also varies a lot. For instance, in some stories, a character might be judged pure of heart if they are never tempted. In this model, a character even considering a temptation towards evil is enough to disqualify them from pure of heart status. Heroically struggling to resist that temptation, or considering it before realizing the consequences it'll have in rejecting it, aren't good enough. The only way a character can be truly pure of heart in this structure is if they never even consider taking the evil option. This is generally considered to be a fairly flawed structure, and might even be called out in-universe for being unfair and or unrealistic. Most moral frameworks agree that what a person does matters significantly more than what a person thinks about doing, so for someone to be judged in a sense irredeemable for something they didn't even actually do is pretty unreasonable. Stories with this framework will often address that on 
unfairness and suggests that the test itself is flawed. Nowadays, it's more common for purity of heart to be equated with selflessness. In these paradigms, purity of heart is equated with self-sacrifice and putting the needs and wants of others before one's own. A pure-hearted character in this framework frequently demonstrates their selflessness by giving up a shot at some sort of prize to help someone in distress, which often nets them the true prize of whatever their pure of heartness gives them. This is probably the most solid and well-established definition, as it's easy to demonstrate and disprove, and it's an active choice the character makes, not some latent property they have no say or control over. It also allows for character development, as a previously self-centered character can grow and change to become selflessly heroic and thus worthy. And if you've got a magical, choosy artifact in the neighborhood, it might pop up to signal to the audience that the character's finished developing and is a certified good boy now. Selflessness is also often demonstrated by way of a heroic sacrifice, which is always good for drama. And as a bonus, if your heroic sacrifice nets you some kind of magical power-up, it can even involve a fake-out death before the pure of heartness gets demonstrated, etc, etc. Very standard stuff. Now, in more old-school media, like Victorian-era fairy tales and the early Disney movies derived from them, it was common for pure of heartness to be equated with being kind and forgiving. Fairy tale heroines, for instance, are almost always pathologically incapable of standing up for themselves, but will be rewarded for their kindness by the universe itself, which bends around them to solve their problems. These characters are usually kind, generous, humble, and incapable of expressing any emotion south of quiet ennui. They respond to cruelty and suffering with the beatific patience of a saint. In this paradigm, anger is treated as a component of being bad, and while a character might suffer endless injustices, they prove their purity of heart by never indulging in anger or revenge by lashing out or fighting back. This is questionable, and in these stories, the character is almost always helped by someone who is either powerful enough to circumvent these problems the character is facing, or is not pure of heart and willing to stop those problems with their bare hands. The first approach is rather more common. Fairy godmothers ex machina, friendly animals, and other such fairy tale stables will usually orchestrate a scenario where the protagonist can rise above their problems without getting their hands dirty. In more modern stories, however, this pure-hearted character might have a rather more angry supporting cast and or love interest willing to stand up for them when they can't. And finally, some stories equate purity of heart with being very naive. These characters are pure of heart because they genuinely don't seem to understand anything else. They can't comprehend evil or even just general not-niceness, and they're pure of heart because they have no idea what the alternative is. These characters are typically quite sheltered when they start out, and will sometimes undergo arcs where they're exposed to the unpleasantness of the world and actually lose their uncritical goodness. But in cases where these characters are explicitly deemed pure of heart by the narrative, exposure to the moral complexities of the world doesn't tend to affect their good-heartedness at all. They might be confused or dismayed at the more unpleasant parts, but it won't make them any less friendly or kind. These characters are almost completely non-malicious. Anything they do comes from a genuine place of wanting to help or do the right thing. This has some overlap with the kind and forgiving version, and they both seem to draw on a concept of goodness that equates goodness with innocence, specifically the version of innocence equated with childishness or ignorance, you know, Garden of Eden style. It is interesting that people equate childhood with innocence, as if children aren't capable of incredible malice and cruelty when they want to be. I mean, have you met middle schoolers? But regardless of realism, the trope still stands. Sometimes purity of heart means childlike idealism, sheltered from the gray complexities of the world. Unlike the kind and forgiving variant, these pure of heart characters can and frequently do get angry, but it'll be like a righteous anger at an injustice in the world that they didn't know was possible. Oddly, these pure of heart characters seem to be disproportionately likely to actually do a lot of morally dubious stuff, whether or not the narrative seems to realize that's what they're doing. Because they're 100% non-malicious and don't seem to realize what the consequences of their actions might be, they don't get deemed bad by whatever's doing the judging. And there's something to that, actually. Pure of heart isn't really the same thing as pure of action. The trope is explicitly framed to describe something about the way the character internally functions, not how the character's actions affect the world around them. There's a reason large swaths of this trope are just dedicated to magically judging the character's inherent nature with some kind of mystic vibe detector rather than referencing any of their actual actions. The character's actions might realistically matter more than their intentions, but this judgment is specifically assessing those intentions. The Never Tempted variant exists for a reason, and even if it's mostly deconstructed these days, it does represent an important component of this trope. A Never Tempted type character who never even considers the morally bad option is indeed pure of heart by the simplest definition possible. Their heart and mind is clear of self-centered or malicious motivations. That's not a mandatory prerequisite of doing good things, of course. Someone can have self-centered or malicious motives and still only do good things. But it can be argued that the whole point of the pure of heart trope is to assess what characters have literally no bad stuff in their hearts. This varies, of course. For instance, the practically pure types that are just completely incorruptible can still 
have malicious or selfish impulses. In fact, it's very common for them to have those impulses, since what makes them pure of heart is that they never, ever act on those impulses, hence their incorruptibility. It's difficult to demonstrate that you're incorruptible if you're never faced with the temptation of corruption. This is a different spin on the definition, since it acknowledges that the character has darkness in their heart, but actively chooses to keep it contained. In some stories, that's not enough, and to qualify as pure of heart, a character must have exactly no dark impulses anywhere in their head. This dissonance dates as far back as ancient Greece. Even Aristotle burned entire chapters debating whether it's more evil to know something is bad and still do it, or to be so bad you don't even recognize what badness is. This specific debate shows up all over the place, including Skyrim of all places, where the dragon Parthenax asks the player if it's better to be born good or to overcome one's evil nature through great effort. Blue assures me that this space of moral philosophy is really fun to discuss over a glass of something alcoholic and fancy, but unfortunately all that fascinating nuance gets flattened pretty hard just by virtue of how this trope works. See, this definition starts becoming a problem the minute we look at it closely, and that's never a good sign. As mentioned, pure of heart doesn't mean pure of action. A character can be very much not pure of heart and still basically only do good things. But on the flip side, a character that is pure of heart, even by the strictest definition, can do a lot of very bad stuff. Just because the character's motives are selfless and righteous doesn't mean their actions are going to be morally flawless. A character whose purity of heart is the childlike innocence variant, for instance, might be completely open to befriending some very bad people, and in pursuit of that might incidentally enable some very bad things if they let those very bad people go on their merry way instead of taking more extreme measures to stop them for good. But that's just one example. Suppose a character is given a choice between two options, A and B, and they know that picking option A will result in something bad happening. If the character knowingly chooses to make something bad happen by picking A, we could, to simplify a freshman year ethics course, conclude that they did something bad. Even if they picked A for the best of reasons, they'd still be knowingly and consciously causing the bad consequences. Maybe it'd be worth it, maybe it wouldn't be worth it, maybe they knew it was going to be a hard choice with no right answer and they did it anyway because it had to be done, it's still morally smudgy. But now, suppose a different character is given that choice and has no idea that the consequences of option A will be bad. They make the choice they think is right, the bad consequences happen. It doesn't matter if they find out about those consequences or not, because there is one key difference between how we're inclined to judge these two characters. The second character didn't knowingly choose to make the bad stuff happen. That first character knew picking chocolate over strawberry would drop the cable car full of puppies, but the second character just thought it was about ice cream like any reasonable person. The consequences of their choices are the same, but all other things being equal, we as an audience are inclined to conclude that the second character is less morally responsible for what happened because they made their choice without realizing it would do anything bad. The only difference between the two scenarios is that the second character didn't know the bad thing would happen. Their ignorance protects them from bearing that moral weight. It was a completely innocent choice, unlike the first character who made an informed choice and knowingly caused the bad outcome. And frankly, even if both options were bad and that first character was stuck in a trolley problem with no good options, we're still reflexively inclined to find them more morally culpable than the second character because they knew the situation they were part of was going to have a terrible outcome. But what this conclusion implies is that a character who is pure of heart, who doesn't realize what they're doing is wrong, can cause any number of terrible consequences without compromising their pure of heart quality. The example of this question that gets thrown around most frequently is a pretty garden variety trolley problem. Should a hero kill a villain to save the lives of all that villain's future victims? If a pure hearted hero with a code against killing has a choice between killing the villain once and for all and putting the villain in the world's most escapable jail, the hero will not kill the villain because that'll be against their morals. But then, when the villain escapes, they kill a hundred people. Because the hero stuck with their principles, a hundred innocent people died instead of just one really bad person. Does that mean the hero should have killed the villain? Not necessarily! Maybe the prison just needs some better fucking locks, how about that? But the point is, the hero stuck to their principles. If we're measuring just by pure of heart standards, that was unequivocally the right thing to do. Because it's not just one life versus 100 innocent lives. The factor we're missing in this equation is one life knowingly taken versus 100 innocent lives tragically lost through circumstance. Hell, the hero might never even learn about those 100 lives lost and will continue on their merry way totally guilt-free, just as pure-hearted as they were the day before. The moral weight of knowingly doing one bad thing tips the scales significantly. Even if the pure-hearted hero swallows their morals and actually kills the villain and saves 100 lives, the hero is now living with the guilt that they knowingly and willfully did something they knew was wrong. Those 100 lives don't make up for that. The hero is still compromised on their principles, and that makes them no longer pure of heart. It's an unforgiving metric that doesn't measure based on tangible good done, but on how guilty the character felt doing it. This is why paragons can be some of the most dangerous villains. If they think something is the right thing to do, they will do it, and with enough mental gymnastics to 
contort the situation into something their morals will accept as good, they can do basically anything and feel completely righteous about it. And that gets you into some real deus volti logic, where if you can convince yourself that you're working on behalf of a higher power that stamped you with the any means necessary seal of approval, you can get as stabby as you like on whoever you like and never feel the slightest twinge of fear for your immortal soul. I see you, Crusader fanboys. Get a hobby. Also, it's worth noting that not all pure of heart characters have a personal code against killing, and those are the guys to really watch out for. Because if they decide killing someone is the right thing to do, there's literally no stopping them. Overall, a pure-hearted character can unknowingly enable or even actively do all kinds of truly awful stuff without ever compromising their internal moral compass, which is really the only thing a lot of these pure of heart stories measure. If they never find out anything bad happened, or they never realize that their actions were bad, they're basically existing in a moral vacuum where nothing bad ever did happen and their personal morals are just as squeaky clean as ever. And that's why it's an imperfect metric that often rings false with audiences. Sure, the character might not have known that letting the mass murdering bad guy go would have such devastating collateral consequences, but they probably could have thought it through for a second first and realized something terrible was probably going to happen. Ignorance might keep them feeling guilt free, but it doesn't erase the consequences of their actions, and an audience might have some trouble with a character that the story is framing as pure of heart whose cheerful naivete has led to a lot of explicit death and destruction. Pure of heart becomes not my problem. And this isn't just a morally iffy bit of writing. There's also a lot more interesting stuff you can get out of this trope by actually letting the character confront moral complexity rather than shielding them from it. Charmingly dumb, pure of heart characters are loads of fun. Heck, that's a solid two thirds of the himbo archetype right there. But you can get a lot of very interesting narrative mileage out of letting your pure of heart characters actually consider the moral consequences of their actions and consciously seek out a solution that doesn't involve compromising their own personal morals or their practical morals through collateral damage. A pure of heart character who actually understands the circumstances of the trolley problem they're faced with won't willingly choose either option because they can't without compromising their morals and thus their purity of heart, and will often go to great lengths to seek out a third option that'll work for them. It's not always possible, but a lot of stories have pulled off very hopeful and uplifting narratives by letting the pure of heart character actually succeed in finding an ideal solution. A solid example of this is the final struggle of Avatar The Last Airbender, checking off your bingo cards, where Aang struggles with the moral quandary between his fundamentally pacifist air nomad philosophy versus his duty as Avatar to protect the world no matter the personal cost, which in this case involves taking out and probably killing Fire Lord Ozai. Aang is very distraught about this and even rings up previous avatars to ask for advice, and while they all have their own opinion and offer different advice, they're pretty unilaterally in team kill him and feel bad about it later. Aang ends up taking a third option and defeating Ozai by energy bending, which pulls double duty as good thematic storytelling, because not only is it a non-lethal option that'll utterly destroy Ozai without killing or even hurting him, but it's also its own supernatural worthiness test, because the inherent danger of it is that an energy bender with an even slightly corruptible soul will be totally consumed by the evil of the bendy. Aang carefully weighed his options and chose the absolutely most dangerous one possible because it was morally right. Also, fun fact, if you look closely, when Aang rallies and overwhelms Ozai, his tattoos glow, indicating that the final push that let him win was finally attaining inner peace with the Avatar state itself. So it all comes full circle, since Aang's been treating the Avatar state as a part of himself he fears and rejects, like a super-powered evil side. Once he accepts that it's just him, all that scariness drains away and he passes the supernatural worthiness test. So sure, ignorance is definitely the easier way to keep a pure of heart character looking morally spotless, but it doesn't hold up to scrutiny anywhere near as well as self-aware and thoughtful heroism does. Ultimately, this is a trope that examines intent, not action. If the character's intentions are completely good, however we're specifically measuring good, they can qualify as pure of heart. This means a character with a very narrow understanding of the world can very easily operate under a paradigm where all their choices are made with the best of intentions, because to them, the world is a simple binary. Maybe, for instance, being nice is good, being mean is bad, so always be nice. A character with a more nuanced and broad understanding of the world, however, will often struggle to make choices that are 100% good by their personal metric, because it's very easy for definitions of good to come into conflict with each other. For instance, being nice might be good, but enabling someone's harmful behaviors is bad, but firmly telling them to knock it off would be mean and therefore bad. Essentially, the more complex the character's definition of good and bad or right and wrong are, the harder it is for the character to intentionally make a decision that they consider fully good. And since intent is the only thing pure of heart really measures, this means it's significantly easier to write a pure of heart character who is, in a word, dumb, or in a slightly less judgy word, uncomplicated. For such a simple trope, it's surprisingly difficult to make work because it's drawing on such a nuanced and very fraught part of human nature. And maybe that shouldn't be surprising, frankly. There are ethical arguments that have been continuously running through scholarship for thousands of years. They're not going to work out the ideal solution in a kid's cartoon. So, yeah. <laughs>